things sort out. All right, Psalm 34. Uh, this is where we'll be taking our thoughts this morning. Was there ever a food that you couldn't stand as a child, but which you've grown to enjoy now that you're as an adult? For me, it was three things. Cheese, mushrooms, and peas. I couldn't stand them as a child. But uh, now, I love them all. I mean, if you get up for breakfast, a nice bit of toasted cheese and sautéed mushrooms on top, that's my idea of a good breakfast. People are funny about their food, about what they like and what they don't like. For some people, they boast that they've never eaten anything green. Now, really, that's not something to brag about. <laughs> there are some unusual things that uh, out there that people will eat. We have Americans on occasion that will come to visit us and we take great delight in putting haggis on the table. <laughs> And uh, we put it out in front of us, they've never seen anything like it before, and they say, what's that? What's it made of? We say, eat it first, we'll tell you later. I remember the first time I ate kimchi, have you ever heard of kimchi? It's a Korean thing, it's a, it's a Korean version of sauerkraut, it's fermented cabbage, made of all sorts of things, including hot chili powder and salty fish sauce. I remember the first time that I saw it. I really turned my nose up at it, and for years I'd pass it by, no thanks. But I did finally give it a try. It's supposed to be a great source of vitamin C, among other things. I ended up liking it. Now today, I enjoy a bit of kimchi on the side of my plate, uh, if I'm eating something Korean. Talking about strange foods on offer, but you know, all too often there's some really good, wholesome, everyday foods that we can put on the table, and we, we know they're good for us, but people will turn out their noses from it and walk away. If you would just try them, you might like it. For years, uh, for centuries really, the islanders at some Pacific, South Pacific islands there's, uh, suffered from malnutrition. Hanging all around them on the banana trees were bananas full of the nutrients, uh, the vitamins and the minerals that they would need. But they wouldn't eat the bananas. They were afraid, according to their belief, that if they, when they opened up the banana, that an evil spirit would come out and take possession of them. All this healthy food hanging on the trees, but they wouldn't touch it. Have you ever tried to get a child to eat their vegetables? Now, telling a child that it's good for them just doesn't work. <laughs> How often can you uh, uh, try to encourage them? I remember um, sitting, uh, finishing up the table sometimes, cleaned, we've washed the dishes, and there was still one child sitting at the table, you know, refusing to eat. And uh, wearing your patience down until finally, as a parent, you say, Will you just take one bite? And then you can go. And, uh, but you know, now you look back, and uh, their kids, our kids, thankfully enjoy all sorts of things. We're glad that we stuck by our guns on that one. I remember uh, when I was at university, and uh, there was um, the pastor and his wife, they were a bit older in years, and uh, one of their sons. Though, uh, the youngest was still at home in high school. And uh, so we started palling around a little bit. I was still single at the time. And uh, but I came to discover he would only eat one thing a hamburger. And it was a hamburger patty in a bun, no lettuce, no tomato, no nothing, just some ketchup. And he would eat it for supper, for dinner, lunch, whatever. He would even eat it for breakfast. And that's all he would eat. And I thought to myself, you know, you're going to have health problems later on if you don't diversify your diet just a little bit. Later on, I learned that he got, got married, became a father with children. I called him up one day to see how he was getting on. I said, I bet your wife has adjusted your diet a little bit. He said, he said yes, I'm eating things now that I never ate before. He says, I've discovered I like chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> that same child that uh, once sat at the table refusing to eat the vegetables now as an adult maybe has learned to try just about it. It all begins with taste, doesn't it? Just tasting something. Down to choice, having an open mind, being willing to step outside of your comfort, comfort zone for a minute, beyond the familiar, beyond what you know, or beyond what you think you know, and giving it a try. Oh, I won't like that. Well, how do you know unless you tried it? Psalm 34, verse 8, is my text this morning, and it says, O taste and see 
that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one that trusted in him. How many people stand apart from trusting in Christ, much like a child refusing to eat their vegetables. You tell them, try it, it's good for you. Vegetables, as we know, are full of vitamins and minerals that will contribute to strong and healthy bodies, will help you live a better life. Yet, even knowing something is good for you, how often do we still refuse to give it a try? And people are the same when it comes to the things of God. Why don't you come to church? I won't like it. It's boring. Well, have you ever been? No. Well, then how do you know unless you give it a try? The Bible is full of contradictions and lies. Well, have you ever read it for yourself? No. Well, then how do you know? Verse 8 tells us to taste and see. Taste for yourselves and see that the Lord is good. David asserts it as a matter of fact. He just states, the Lord is good, as if there's no question about it. Someone might say, well, how can you say that? How do you know that he's good? And David replies, because I have tasted him for myself, and I have discovered him to be good. Look at verses 1, 2, and 3 at the opening of the Psalms. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David noticed at all times, he says, continually praising God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us to rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, rejoice in Him always. It's a good thing to praise God. It's a good thing to be joyful. And it's something that we might need to practice. It doesn't always come naturally to us. Think of something that you can thank God for and before too long you'll be counting your blessings. David's resolve was to praise God all the time. He says in verse 2, And my soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. David might be king, but he had forgotten uh, uh, the, the lowly person. He says, Even the humble are going to hear God's praise from me. The mes message that the Lord is good is for everyone, from the lowest to the highest. Let us hear it and be glad. You know, there is a special place in the heart of God for the lowly, for the humble, for those who have been downtrodden and oppressed in life. He says, come unto me, <clears throat> all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. 1 John chapter 5 verse 3 tells us this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. God is not out there to make your life worse. He's out there to deliver you from all your troubles. How many times, as we read through Psalm 34, did David use the phrase that God delivers us out of our troubles? And so verse 3, he says, Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let us talk of all his wondrous works. Has God done something good for you? Then thank him for it. Praise him for it. And then let's talk about it. There's so much ill, so much false and undeserved that is spoken of God today. Let us speak liberally, those of us who are of his people, those of us who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Let's speak of it and let's proclaim it abroad. Why did David feel this way? Why was he so full of joy? Look at the title to the psalm. Just before the first verse, it says, A psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. These titles are not additions added by the translators to help us understand when the psalm was written. These are part of the original Hebrew manuscripts. This is... David wrote this psalm in memory of this occasion. It was a time when David was at a low point in his life. Things had been going on the up and up. He seemed destined for the throne of Israel. And then he found himself fleeing for his life. The king was out to kill him, was chasing him in hot pursuit. David found a place of refuge, but it was in the wilderness. 
far away from family and friends, from the comforts of life at home. But God did not forsake him. David came to the point, as we see in the psalm, where he was able to praise God, to thank him for his blessings, even in the wilderness. Look at what he says in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Here David can give thanks to God for deliverance. He delivered me out of my fears, out of my anxieties, out of my worries, out of those things that weighed upon my spirit, upon my mind and heart. God delivered me from these things. Verse 5, he says, They looked unto him and were lightened or enlightened, and their faces were not ashamed. God gives joy. He gives joy that comes with no regrets. How often times do we find ourselves in an experience in life and, uh, uh, and later we have regrets for it. But he says, when you spend time in the presence of the Lord, there's no regret. There's no one that I know of who reaches uh, uh, at the end of their lives and looking back, having given their life to God, saying, I'm sorry I did that. There's joy and there's comfort when we face the future, knowing that God is our Saviour. Verse 6, this poor man cried, but the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. God hears. When you cry out to him, God hears. Look what it says down in verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. God hears us when we call out to him. But more than that, God is able to meet us at the point of our aim. He is able to do something about our problems. Those things that are beyond our power, those things that are beyond our control, God hears and he saves us from all our troubles. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. God sees to it that we are surrounded by his care. We are protected from evil. And so David celebrates the Lord. The Lord is good. He has ample reason to feel that way. You know, if the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that God is good. God is originally, essentially, unchangeably, supremely, infinitely, independently, absolutely, universally, and eternally good. We can see his goodness in his creation. Genesis 8 reminds us that while the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, these shall not cease. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 that God makes the sun to rise upon the evil and the good and sends the rain upon the just and the unjust. He set the rainbow in the clouds to remind us of his all-encompassing mercy, that though there might be a storm cloud in the horizon today, that the sun will shine again. Lamentations chapter 3 tells us it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3, and it was a text for which that uh, hymn uh, uh, was based on. Matthew chapter 6. Consider the lilies of the field, how they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that not one of them, uh, 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 not even Solomon, uh, was arrayed, in all his glory, was arrayed like unto one of them. He said, Look at the flowers of the field, more beautiful than all of man's pomp and ceremony. Are not two sparrows sold in the marketplace for a farthing? Do you remember farthings? Now I'm telling on my age. <laughs> a farthing, if you're not sure, was a quarter of a penny, a very tiny thing. But I can still remember, maybe some of you uh, from old days and I have to remember Marais, the old sweetie shop just down the road from the school, just up there. Uh, I think it was next door was Keith, next door to your house, I think it's where Mar Marais used to be. And I remember, even for a farthing, you could go in and get a chew or a bubble gum or something like that. It's amazing what you could buy in those days with just so little. But anyways, I digress. 
Are not two sparrows sold in the marketplace for a farthing, and yet not one of them? How cheap and, and, and um, insignificant are these little things? And yet, Jesus says, not one of them can fall to the ground without your Father in heaven knowing. And then he asks this thought, think about it for a moment. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. We can see God's goodness all around us, in his creation, in his care for us. We can see his goodness in his bountiful provision. Psalm 145, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 tells us, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. By Christ Jesus. God is a generous God. And above all this, we can see his goodness in providing for our redemption. Though we have sinned against him, though we may have blasphemed his holy name, though we may defy his ways and disobey his commandments, though we might be opposed to his lordship in our life, yet in his grace he reaches out to us and has provided for our salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God commended his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We deserve nothing from him, but such is our God, that he loves us in spite of ourselves. Though we may deserve nothing from him, yet he freely offers his salvation, forgiveness and healing and life and peace and joy. He is ready and willing to share all the glories and wonders of his heavenly kingdom for all eternity. All this, if we but turn to his Son, the Lord Jesus, and trust in him. Is it any wonder then that David proclaims, the Lord is good? God has laid out before us, like a feast on the table, the riches of his grace, the promises of his word, the eternal blessedness of his salvation, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and so much more. And how do we respond? All too often, just like the child, folding our arms, wrinkling our brows, turning up our nose, and, I don't want that, stubbornly refusing to try a delicious meal spread out before you. David encourages us, oh taste, taste for yourself, see, reach out in faith in, uh, to the Lord and, and see for yourself, he will not disappoint. But there's more. The scriptures does not end with an invitation to taste. Turn, if you will, now to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John and chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 51. Here Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Here, Jesus encourages us not just to taste, but to eat. You know, bread is a staple much the world over. Essential grains, well, corn, wheat, maize, um, barley, oats, rice. These contain many of the essential vitamins and minerals that are necessary for a healthy, strong body. And bread is generally inexpensive. It's generally plentiful in ordinary circumstances and in, 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 in plentiful supply. You can get bread just about anywhere. Jesus continually referred to bread in his teachings. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 4. Just as bread is to the body, so is the word of God to your soul. Jesus said on another occasion, in fact, um, uh, uh, that uh, when he 
encouraging us to pray and in, in part of the, the Lord's prayer is give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need from day to day. One could look at that and typically we do is asking for material blessings, which is absolutely right. And there's nothing wrong with going to God when you have need and asking for Him to meet your physical needs. But you could also see in that a, a request for spiritual nourishment. Give us this day our daily bread. When speaking of God's willingness to bless his people, Jesus had asked, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that seeketh shall find. Uh, everyone that asks shall receive, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Which one of you, being a father, if a son comes and asks you for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he comes and asks you for fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So Jesus spoke often of bread in his teachings. When we come to John chapter 6, look at verse 27. Jesus says, Labor not for the meat or the food which perishes, but for that which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him. Hath the God, Father, God the Father sealed. What, is Jesus, uh, what caused the Lord to say such a thing here? Don't labor for the food that perishes, but labor for that which will last for all eternity. You see, the day before, Jesus had performed a miracle. People had come out to him in the wilderness to hear him, and he talked all day. By the end of the day, they were, of course, it was time to go home. They'd been there, uh, and many of them hadn't eaten. And the Lord saw their physical needs and desired to provide for them. He asked his uh, disciples if there was anything available, testing their faith. And of course, eventually they found a little lad with a, he brought with him a lunch. His mum had packed him away. You remember, was it a couple of fishes and five loaves of barley bread? And the disciple brought this to Jesus. It's all we've been able to find. But what's that among so many? And Jesus said, it's enough. God can take the smallest thing and do something amazing with it. And so we had the people sit down. And he prayed over the food. And then began passing it around. And before too long, everyone had eaten their fill. It was an amazing miracle. Demonstrating his, the power of God resting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the next day, the crowds came. were still following him. Everywhere he went, the crowds were following, and Jesus turned around to them and said, you know, you're following me for the free food, but you failed to see the deeper need of your soul. And so he said to them in verse 27, don't work so hard for the meat that perishes. What you should be seeking after, what you should be striving for, is spiritual food. The message that I'm here to give you. The bread that you will eat is of only temporary benefit. You'll be hungry a few hours later. You'll eat fresh bread for too long and after a day it goes a bit stale. A couple days later on it starts to get moldy and you can't touch it at all. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And he says, but the bread that I have to give you is something that will endure unto everlasting life. He said much the same thing when he met the woman by the well. He asked her for a drink and, and she gave him something to drink and, he said, you know, this water, if you drink of this water, pointing to the water in the well, said, you'll be thirsty again. But if you drink of the water that I have to give you, you will never thirst. But the water that I have to give you will be like wells of living water, springing up inside unto life eternal. So Jesus encouraged them, don't be following me for the free food. Don't be looking for the, the material things that are, are, are here and gone tomorrow. Seek something of a higher value. He says in verse 51, I am the living bread. The living bread which comes down from heaven. And if any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. The la and the bread which I will give is my flesh. And I will give it for the life of the world. What is Jesus asking us to do here? Well, contrary to some misconceptions, he's not talking about some kind of spiritual cannibalism. 
But he is addressing a core problem over which many people, particularly, I find, religious people, can stumble. It's getting down to the essence of faith. What does it really mean to truly believe? It's not just knowledge. It's not just intellect. It's not doing charitable work. It's not having the power to work miracles. It's not even you know, the showing a martyr's zeal that we most need. What we need to do is to eat, to partake of Jesus Christ himself in a personal way, in a real and powerful way. Not to stand at a distance, content to know a few facts about him, but respond to him from the heart in a real and personal way. Something that involves your mind and your will and commands your love and obedience, a yielding of your body and soul to him. This is what Jesus means when he asks us to eat of the living bread. Christianity is not a cold, impersonal religion in which we memorize a few things and do a few spiritual things or a few religious things. Christianity is not something only to be known, it's something to be experienced. But how many religious people go through life having knowledge but no experience? Having theory but never having felt the power? Jesus asks us to eat. He asks us to get stuck in. Don't hold back. Take it in. Make me your own. One final thought before I finish. Turn over to Revelations chapter 19. It's all the way to the back of your Bible. Revelation is the last book in, in the Bible. And chapter 19 is almost one of the last chapters. Revelations 19 and verse 9. And he says to me, write, Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. What's he talking about here? The marriage supper of the Lamb. You kind of have to know your Bibles at this point. You remember, Jesus is the Lamb. He is the Lamb of God who came to give his life and sacrifice for the sins of the world. John 1.29 Remember, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Through Jesus we might have forgiveness of sins and peace with God, the hope of eternal life. He is the Lamb. Jesus is also called the head of the church. In the Bible, the church is sometimes called the bride, and Jesus the bridegroom. Okay? So keeping these facts in mind, what are we talking about? Look at this verse again. Blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's this marriage supper of the Lamb? It's a scene taken from the future. It's a picture of heaven. Where all God's people will be gathered together in the presence of the Lord. And that forevermore. The eternal state here is described in terms of a great feast. What is meant by a feast? What are some of the things that we think of about a feast? A feast speaks of plenty, doesn't it? Of abundance. It's not just a snack, it's a feast. It speaks of extravagance, of nothing lacking, more than enough. It speaks of celebration, of joy. It speaks of sharing fellowship with those we love. Truly, blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Happy will those be who will be there. Jesus often described heaven in terms of a feast. You remember the parables of Jesus. He taught there was a parable of the wedding feast. There was a parable of the great supper in Luke chapter 40. Both of these stories, we have a rich Lord throwing a great feast. And he sent out many invitations, inviting uh, those to come and share in the feast with him. But many people offered excuses. You know, remember that child sitting at the table? Don't want it. That's what they were doing. The excuses might have been polite, but really, they were basically telling the Lord, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I've got better things to do. Something else is more important to me than spending time with you at your feast. Many absented themselves, offering all sorts of excuses. No thanks. I'm busy. Things more important to me. 
So what did the Lord do? He threw open his doors and said, Whomsoever will may come. In one of those parables, a man showed up at the feast without wearing the proper attire. The Lord had thrown him out. What was the significance of all of that? There's nothing worse than showing up at an affair not dressed appropriately. Especially if it's a fancy affair and you've come kind of dressed in everyday clothes. I remember when I was a teacher, I had a recurring nightmare that I showed up at school dressed about pajamas. You know, just worth thinking. Well, what did Jesus say with that particular parable? If we would gain into, into heaven, we've got to be wearing the right clothes. The invitation of the gospel, as I said, goes out to whomsoever will. Anyone may come. But not all will gain admittance. You see, you must be properly attired. Well, what must I be wearing if I want to get to heaven? The robes of righteousness. But I have no righteousness of my own, we might say. All my righteousness is as filthy rags. The best that I can offer God is it's nothing. How can I acquire the robes of righteousness? Well, you see, when you come to Jesus in faith, he casts away your own filthy rags, and he clothes you with his own righteousness. And so clothed in his robes, we may enter the banqueting hall of heaven and sit down at the feast table in the presence of the Lord. A simple thought today, just three things, three points, taste, eat, and feast. Have you tasted of the goodness of the Lord? Have you come and eaten of the bread of life? Is there a place with your name on it, reserved in heaven, at the table of the great feast? At this time of year, at the time of harvest, when we celebrate the many good gifts that God has given to us, let us praise and thank him most of all for his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ the gift of salvation that we have through him. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Amen. May God add his blessing then to these thoughts this morning. Trust us to be here that God can use to be a help to you in your life. John, um, yeah, would you like to come at this time? John, we're going to play in closing. We have to find it. Okay, <laughs> Um, the chorus, we are here to praise him, and uh, uh, it's a lovely chorus that we quite often sing here, and may we just lift our hearts to him in, uh, in, in praise this morning. And then afterwards, um, let's see, I wonder, Brother Ali, would you like to bring the service to close with a word?